Why is full frame called full frame? For stills cameras, the term full frame seems to have come about in the early 2000s, but to fully understand why, we actually need to look way back to cinematography in the late 19th century. Now, if you're thinking, Dave, I couldn't give a damn about the history of photography, I want to know about photography in the here and now, and I want to improve my skills. Well, firstly, why did you click on a video with a title such as this? But more importantly, why not check out Skillshare, who are sponsoring this video? Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes. Not just photography, but a wide range of other creative skills, including music, art, graphic design, and animation. The classes cover a huge selection of various topics, catering to all skill sets. Classes are on average between 30 to 60 minutes long, so they can cover topics in depth. However, they are broken up into small chapters, which makes them easy to fit around even the busiest schedules. Such as Sam Morrison's class, Bigger, Better, Different, that inspired me to go back and experiment with re-editing some of my own images. So, if you're interested in Skillshare, then click the link in the video description, and if you're one of the first 1,000 people to do so before the end of September, you'll receive a one-month free trial. So why not check them out today? At the tail end of the 1800s, George Eastman created the Eastman Kodak Company and began to manufacture flexible film rolls. Soon after this, Thomas Edison and William Kennedy Dixon started to build the first machines that could project images from a roll of film. For this, they took 70 mm film rolls and cut them in half lengthways to give them a film strip that was 35 mm wide. They then cut perforations into the side for the cameras to grip onto. Now, the cameras at the time required the film to run vertically behind the film gate. So with the film being 35 mm wide, minus the perforations, left 24 mm for the negatives horizontal which meant having an 18 mil vertical to suit the 1.33 to 1 aspect ratio that was used for cinema at that time. This film quickly became the industry standard for motion picture cameras and would go on to be known as Super 35 film. Now, the film gate on a camera is where the film passes behind and is basically the opening which exposes the film to light. Now, if the gate was used at its maximum height and width, it would fully expose the 35mm film negative, and this was known as shooting as full gate or full frame. But while 35mm film became the standard for motion pictures, stills photography already had many different sizes of film on the market, pretty much all of which were much larger than 35mm in order to capture as much light as possible. However, this large film inherently meant large and heavy cameras, which didn't suit everyone, such as a German photographer by the name of Oscar Barnack, who worked for the Lights Company. He was asthmatic and struggled to carry large, heavy cameras at the time, and so in around 1913, he began to work on the idea of creating a more compact camera by using 35mm cine film instead. His designs then gained a major breakthrough when he developed a way of allowing the film to pass horizontally behind the lens rather than vertically. By doing this, it meant that the 24mm gap in the film between the perforations would now become the vertical of the frame rather than the horizontal, and the old 18mm vertical could be doubled up to 36mm to give a 3 by 2 ratio negative with a much larger area but still within the same size of film. This camera developed into what would be named the Lights Camera, which was released in 1925 with the shortened named the Leica. Lights would later rebrand themselves as Leica because of this. This camera did, however, create a slight problem in that all of the lenses at the time for 35mm film cinema cameras were only designed to work with a 24 by 18 negative, which then meant that lights had to develop a whole new range of lenses to work with the enlarged film negative. This 36 by 24 mm film for stills cameras would be standardized in 1934 by Kodak and called 135 film, 
However, as far as I can tell, this was never known as full frame film because there were already lots of larger film formats on the market of various different sizes, which would eventually be categorized into small, medium, and large formats. The 35mm film being known as small format. And 135 film quickly became the popular choice amongst photographers and stayed that way pretty much until the shift to digital began in the mid 1990s. Now, I promise we are about to get onto why full frame is called full frame, but at this point, it is worth noting that while digital censored SLRs didn't hit the mainstream markets until the 1990s, the system's amounts that we associate with DSLRs were released long before this. For example, the Canon EOS system and EF mount were released back in 1987 as a way of allowing cameras to control lenses via electronic signals rather than direct mechanical linkages. So, coming into the 1990s, digital sensors were not a completely new technology. CCD sensor cameras had been created almost 20 years beforehand, but these were very niche at the time, and it wasn't until 1991 that the first commercial DSLRs started to show up. And these basically used pre-existing film SLR bodies, which was kind of the smart thing to do. They could have developed a whole new camera system, but what would be the point? The systems had all the features required and an established lens catalog to go with it. It was just a matter of changing the recording medium from a roll of film to a digital sensor. However, due to the relatively new technology and the high manufacturing costs of sensors, they weren't particularly large to begin with. The Nikon E-series cameras from 1995 only had a two-thirds of an inch sensor. So for many years, there were lots of digital cameras being released by many different manufacturers, all on camera systems that were originally designed for 36 by 24 mil film, which meant they were all using lenses designed to project onto 36 by 24 mil film sizes, but all the sensors were smaller than 36 by 24, which meant every single camera had a crop of some form. It wasn't until 2002, almost 20 years ago today, that the first digital cameras with 36 by 24 mil sensors were launched. First, the Contax N Digital, followed soon after by the Canon 1DS. These were the first DSLRs that could actually make use of the lenses that were designed for that system. And so, because these systems were 35 mil compatible, but had many different sensor sizes available, the 35mm sensors became known as full frame, and that naming has stuck ever since. Now, some people argue that the term full frame shouldn't really be used anymore, as there are now larger digital formats available, and now with the introduction of APS-C lenses, all the sensors have corresponding lenses that allow them to technically see their own full frames. The issue with this, though, is what would you change the name to and would it actually make any difference? We can't really go back to calling it 35mm because the sensors aren't 35mm since there's no perforations above and below it. You couldn't even really go with calling it 36mm as the sensors aren't all exactly 36 by 24 mil You couldn't go back to calling it small format since there are now lots of smaller formats it would require a totally new naming convention that was completely unrelated to size in order to work. But then would it actually make any difference whatsoever? Well, apart from creating a massive headache for people trying to get to grips with a whole new naming structure, no, not really. And speaking of mass headaches, that pretty much brings this video to a close. If you've made it this far, Congratulations, and as always, if you have any questions or queries, feel free to leave them in the comment section down below. While you're down there, if you found this video helpful, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe button if you haven't already done so, and then hopefully, we'll see you in the next video.